Well, thank you all for being here. This is this is exciting for me. I I I know we've been talking about this idea of resiliency on so many different levels, and I think it's just really solidified for me how complicated and how many things are interrelated and at what scale, like individual or community or regional or world. And it's um, it's fascinating. So um, Faith is joining us today, and I'm, I'm really excited about this. Most of you already, already know Faith, chapter leader and our soil health guide and has presented at the Soil and Nutrition Conference, uh, I believe, multiple times. But um, this is going to be a wonderful continuation of that discussion that we've been having um, last month with Chris Hubbard talking about seeds and resiliency and how that all ties in. And um, Faith, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and a little bit about your new role and uh, mm -hmm. let you let you take it from there. And if you, sure. how would you like to get questions through the chat or wait and then have people ask? Both is fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. And then also to let people know, maybe just towards the end, Dan is going to pop on. He wants to talk a little bit about the upcoming um, online soil and nutrition conference. And then also, I think uh, a few more updates. But this is super exciting. I don't want to take the time. So Faith, um, please, uh, let, let, let's go. Mm, thank you, Shauna. Thanks, everybody. It's really fun to be back with you. It's been a couple months since I've been able to join, maybe maybe three or four months, maybe more. I don't know. Um, I see Chris. Hi, Chris McHugh. <laughs> um, yeah, so I picked up a new role. Um, you know, my my perpetual role in life is a soil nerd. I am, you know, a, a huge advocate of um, using nutrition and uh, for plant health and for soil health, uh, working with biology. I spent, you know, 11 years of my life growing uh, food for a small company here in our community. We live in, I live in Fairfield. Uh, it's a small uh, rural community in Southeast Iowa. We're a community of under 10,000 in our city and under 16,000, just under 16,000 in our, um, in our county. So really small rural Midwest town, but we're super progressive because we have this really unique university in our community. And that's one of the reasons why I uh, showed up here. I'm normally from, well, originally from uh, Georgia, but I showed up here to study sustainable living back in 2009 at this university. And so got my permaculture degree and got to study with Elaine Ingham and got really inoculated into the world of soil biology. Lived that life as a grower for 11 years right. and then and then as that, um, as that project was uh, phasing out, I maintained that farm. I got to start the farm back in 2011, a nice little perennial polyculture farm, three acres. It's my just love, you know, love that little spot. So I still maintain that as a, as a small scale grower in our community, selling fruit into our uh, farmer's market. But then I started um, in 2015, while I was still working with that company, um, really digging into agronomy, really digging into um, the BFA and uh, found Dan, found the BFA, had Dan come out to Fairfield and do a two day course, had him come and do an introductory course and just fell in love with the process of remineral remineralizing the soil. I was already into the whole biological realm. And so continued on that path, educating myself. And then finally, at our last conference, our last in-person conference, was that 2018 or 2019? Was that 2019? We did. We in had a 2019, 2019. in-person conference. Mm -hmm. And so uh, December of 2019, I went up to Dan and I was like, please let me help. <laughs> please let me be like the soil, uh, you know, the the soil assistant here with um, the members. And so um, I plugged in as the soil health guide for um, the Bionutrient Food Association in the beginning of 2020 and um, have been kind of following that path for quite some time. I have a business, it's called Faith and Soil. You can locate it on the uh, interwebs, faithandsoil.com. And, um, and just love working with growers, homesteaders, home gardeners, everyone just sharing what we've been learning all together collectively here in the community of nutrient rich food production or, you know, high inter high uh, nutrient integrity food as John is now saying. 
Nice. I like that. Um, and so I, I am a part of a nonprofit. I'm on the board of a nonprofit called the sustainability or the sustainable living coalition, where I, in two seasons prior was able to do a, um, a garden project for home growers, um, low and modern income home growers. It was called the Fairfield Garden Initiative. And so I got to really get in the backyards of all of these uh, home gardeners in the community and just bring all of this knowledge into their backyard. So they, you know, um, were able to enhance their gardening um, activities or start them for the first time. Many of them were brand new gardeners. And so that was really great. Um, that kind of pointed me in the direction of the role I'm in now. Um, I was, um, you know, uh, in essence, kind of asked to to apply for this position in the in the community. We have um, a Sierra Club chapter in our community, and the Sierra Club chapter, the chair and the co chair, um, went through the process in 2020 and took Fairfield's comprehensive plan, which Fairfield is a, as I mentioned, a pretty progressive community oriented towards sustainability because we have that sustainable living um, department at our uh, local university. So we spun off a lot of enterprises in the community, solar installers, um, you know, wind, um, you know, you know, working in the wind industry, um, a lot of interest around compost. We had a really magnificent um, uh, uh, biocomplete compost uh, enterprise in the community that was large scale windrow, just some really wonderful um, enterprises that have been spun off from this university. So we have a lot of um, a lot of movement towards sustainability in our community, um, but we didn't have a sustainability coordinator uh, as a part of our city. Uh, we had one for five years between 2009 and uh, 2014 when our first sustainability plan, kind of like the climate action plan of today, was generated. It was called the Go Green Plan. And uh, the Go Green Plan was developed by the Go Green Commission, which was at the time our mayor, Ed Malloy, who ended up being our mayor for 18 years. He was really awesome. As many of the wonderful things in Fairfield can be pointed directly towards Ed. Um, but he he uh, convened this uh, Go Green Commission to write the Go, Ge Go Green Plan. It was one of the first kind of climate action plans or sustainability plans in the Midwest in 2009, uh, in a tiny little rural, you know, Southeast Iowa community, really awesome. So we had a, a really interesting um, collaboration between our local city of Fairfield and our Iowa State University Extension Office. Um, they co-funded a sustainability uh, coordinator position for Fairfield back in 2009. And it was a three-year position. And this person was hired to implement a plan, the Go Green plan. So the plan was already developed. He was hired to implement the plan. He did amazing work. And he brought um, a lot of the projects forward. You know, we we had, um, you know, aims and goals, objective set that we far exceeded. Um, you know, we we were really, you know, we were shooting for really conservative goals around solar. And we like, you know, way blew it out of the water and, you know, did some really wonderful things. Um, the funding for that position sundowned. And so after five years, he was no longer with us. And so from 2014 till um 2022 we weren't um we had no sustainability coordinator um so back to the sierra club chapter our chair and co-chair our chair ann walton has worked for noah for 30 years and so she is a process uh oriented person she um she is a um a problem solver she came in you know this is her job she works in marine environments she's a marine biologist by trade. And so she would go to marine environments and look at um, the environmental risks of a scenario and then have to shift, you know, make a plan to shift the activities that were going on to halt the, the potential um, um, degradation of those marine environments. And so she's having to work with communities who have no economy other than that marine environment. So she's having to build these plans to help uh, bring new initiatives into place. And so she is our co-chair or she is our chair of the, of the Sierra Club chapter here in Fairfield. So she being the engine worked with our co-chair 
and reviewed the old expired Go Green plan, our sustainability plan for Fairfield, and our current um, Fairfield Forever plan, which is our comprehensive plan, which is more of a land use plan. It definitely brings in sustainability elements, but it wasn't as deep of a dive as our Go Green plan. They realized after comparing the two, there were initiatives that hadn't been fulfilled on. There wasn't an implementation plan running alongside the Fairfield Forever plan. So they discovered that they needed a new plan. And they went around and fundraised. They realized they had to have a sustainability coordinator to do it. They went around and fundraised um, to fund the position for three years again. And um, and they, you know, it's partially funded by the city, one third funded by the city of Fairfield, one third funded by the local university um, and one third funded by the community. And so that's 54 donors in the community who are pitching in um, to pay the salary for the sustainability coordinator. They hired someone in 2022 to kick off the process. The contract wasn't renewed at the end of that year. It was just like a, it was a commensal type of thing. Um, you know, the, it wasn't necessarily her driving force. And um, so they had to go out and search for another person. They asked me to apply and I did. And, um, w you know, apparently here I am. And uh, and so I have two years. And so we're writing this plan. So that's the background on the whole thing. So we're writing a Fairfield Resiliency Plan. And so and it's going to go alongside our current uh, uh, comprehensive plan. The goal is to have it adopted. Right. What was that? <laughs> we they want to have it adopted, you know, for uh, the city to be able to implement it. Um, so that's our goal. So we have a group, it's called the Resilient Action Committee. That is a group of around 30 to, you know, it could be 30 at some uh, engagement level, could be uh, 40 at some engagement level, you know, it just depends. It's all volunteer. So we have individuals from the community who are experts in their fields, um, or they have domain knowledge that is extensive in, in their area of focus. So these 30 individuals are broken up into six different committees or subcommittees, and that is uh, waste management, land use, buildings and energy, uh, private land stewardship, enterprise solutions and community connections, and foodways. So foodways being my deep passion, right? So uh, the, way, the ways that food, you know, it's in essence kind of the food shed of, of you know, Fairfield, Jefferson County and the surround. So each one of these uh, subcommittees is currently going through the process of identifying the issues, the challenges in our, the challenges in our community. So these are um, individuals who've already been working in these fields and have pretty pretty good domain knowledge around what the actual issues are in Fairfield Jefferson County. Um, you know, nationally is wonderful, but how does that correlate directly? to um, your area, you know, is something that would um, be really successful in in Chicago dealing around, say, food insecurity isn't necessarily the right solution for a small rural community. And so we're trying to develop, uh, the goal is to develop a really practical plan that is uber relevant to us specifically, where many of these plans, these climate action plans or um, comprehensive plans, they are um, in essence written, developed by consulting firms. And so you'll have a group of concerned individuals, whether they are you know, part of your city council or if they're a, a whole separate um, community effort, uh, collaboration, a consortium of individuals, um, they might come around with the ideas and then they, they hire a consulting firm, the whole consulting firm will take the ideas go back to their think tank, do some research, build some modules, and then bring it back for approval. Um, we're, we're not gonna use a consulting firm. We're actually going to be um, the boots on the ground in our community trying to figure out what the real problems are and then um, design really you know, forward thinking solutions oriented towards um, you know, a much more resilient future for, for Fairfield. So, you know, some of the examples of what we might be looking at in each of the of the subcommittees. So for um, food waste, you know, capacity is something that we would love to see increase. You know, we'd love to see the capacity of our local food shed increase 
And so, you know, we have to do that really, you know, deep dive into who are, you know, who are our grower, who are our growers, what is their capacity, um, what limits them um, scaling up? Do they have any desire whatsoever to scale up? Do they feel like the market that they are um, um, selling into is receptive to what they offer? Um, you know, so we have to do these back and forth with with the markets and with the growers, and um, and then we have to figure out, okay, so we need more growers, you know, if, if we intend to have um, more local food in our community to increase the food security for the community as a whole, then, you know, what's, what are the barriers to that happening? And, um, and that's different than food insecurity for those who are financially, um, you know, uh, not able to meet their basic needs. And so there's a whole nother list of, um, of challenges around that. Um, we're also wanting to make sure that farmers, you know, farm viability is absolutely um, relevant into the future. So we need to um, work with, you know, those growers figuring out where are their, you know, where are they hitting their, um, the, the wall with their labor force? Where are they hitting the wall with the equipment that they're using? Um, how is it for them for accessing um you know, inputs, what, you know, how, how can we make this a little bit easier so that the community can thrive um, with, with buildings and energy, you know, that's going to deal with housing. And so we are a community that has um, some, you know, degrading housing stock, you know, where our, our, uh, our city was incorporated, you know, in the mid 1870s. And um, we have housing stock that, many, you know, many of our homes are well over a hundred years old. And if you are in a disadvantaged community as we are, where um, economics is a major issue and you're not able to uh, maintain the, the, the viability of these homes, you know, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with degrading housing stock that may have to be um, demolished at some point. And so uh, how can we stop the degradation? What are, what are some funding sources out there, programs, opportunities for halting degradation? And then, you know, what to do with these lots, you know, these, these uh, vacant lots or underutilized lots that are potentially, you know, we have a lot of those already, but we have a lot um, that may be coming up. And so, you know, what are infill opportunities? What about, um, you know, different unique housing uh, um, developments? Could we consider bringing into our um, city's uh, code of ordinance, you know, thinking about planning and zoning, we're thinking about, you know, unique uh, residential zoning, really wanting to maintain our population. It's really hard for Midwest communities, rural communities to maintain their population. And we have, um, and we want to continue to do that. So we need to survey, you know, individuals who are interested to come and work in our community, but they're not finding the housing that they're looking for. And what are the gaps there? And so the plan is focused, um, you know, specifically around Jefferson County and Fairfield, but we are looking outward into other communities. We are reviewing probably 30 different other communities, um, climate action plans, sustainability plans, you know, comprehensive plans, picking um, elements of each of those plans that map to the issues that we also have and looking to see what solutions they've brought forward. And, um, and then we are, um, you know, we need to do that follow up. You know, you, this is in your plan, but how is it how is it playing out in your community now? And did that work? How would you change it? You know, what what would you suggest if we wanted to implement something like that? How should we shift? Um, so, again, this is a whole new realm for me. I'm only in the position for five months. And so I have. Um, it's it's definitely that whole drinking from a fire hose, coordinating 30 people um, to meet every two weeks. You know, we we meet, our subcommittees meet every two weeks. And so that's, you know, six groups that you're co coordinating to meet every two weeks and then, um, you know, sit down and do all the, the homework. You know, we're walking through these processes in our groups um, where we're, you know, mind mapping, brainstorming, uh, prioritizing issues after we get a list of issues. Then we go through and we do problem trees on all the issues. We do problem statements on all the issues after our problem statements. We move to smart objectives and then, you know, reviewing all these plans and matching those with our objectives for looking for initiatives that we can bring forward. So that's where we are right now. Our goal is to have the plan constructed by the end of this year, uh, 2024, 
and work on an implementation plan um, the beginning of 2025. And, um, you know, we'll all along the way, keeping the county and the city in the loop. I'm technically a city employee. I'm a, um, so I, I get the opportunity to make sure it's trickling in in different ways in the department head meeting or going to city council, things like that. But, the, you know, trying to build a strong relationship between the city and the county would be something I would really love to achieve. Um, and then having, um, you know, adoption of this plan when it's done. And then it would be great for the city to say, oh, that was wonderful. We should fund this position further in <laughs> two years. Yeah. So that's that's where I'm at. Holy moly, Faith. <laughs> that, I, think, <laughs> I, I won't dominate this, but I, I wrote down a couple of things that I found, you know, really interesting. One was you can often read about um, towns or communities that really come together after a disaster. And so what's really interesting to me is that there's this idea of forethought and like deliberate planning. I mean, I didn't get a sense that there was some major catastrophe that that fueled this. So I was curious, I know you talked about the Sierra Club, but is is that really where the motivation is coming from? I know you talked about, you know, it's a third sponsor here, a third here, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's unique. I think the yeah, I think the community itself, you know, um, we're we're oriented towards, um, you know, forward movement. You know, it feels as though our community has had that kind of uh, adoptive uh, mentality where we're looking for more sustainability um, oriented solutions. And I think our mayor had a huge role to play there. But I do think, you know, thinking of a disaster um, initiating a process, COVID is what dropped Ann Walton into Fairfield, you know, and if you were going to look for a community um, to land into, uh, not knowing, you know, what would, uh, what would come, you know, a small community that isn't overpopulated, that has a pretty progressive mindset, and is um, sitting on, you know, some epic soil and pretty mild, you know, weather considering, um, you know, it was a good place for her to land. But I think that, you know, she's a driver, she's a doer. And I think that's, you know, I think that the Sierra Club initiated this round, but this is not the first round yeah. of this process for our community. I think it's ever, ever present. And then I'll ask, um, I'll, I'll let other people chime in after this. But the other thing I was thinking, you know, like there's this idea of place. I know in regenerative agriculture, this is like this, oh, fascinating to actually look at the area where you are. And I heard you kind of touch on that when you were saying, yeah, there are all these plans, but it's really different when you're looking at a specific community. And mm -hmm. one of the things I'm hoping to be able to bring to local chapters is how to start these conversations and and I think part of how difficult it has been on my side of like, well, I'll just write up, you know, 20 questions for discussion. Like <laughs> it's so hard to do that. So I was curious where um where some of your questions come from. Like, are you just looking around in your community or are you really taking from other resources and trying to say, oh yeah, that would be relevant here? Like, what would you mm. recommend for local groups that are are wanting to start this conversation? Yeah, I think, um, you know, inside the subcommittees, when we're trying to identify issues, um, it, it is coming from the work they've already done in the community. Like when we're talking about food insecurity, um, many of us in the food ways were already partic participating in other civic groups um, around um, food insecurity. So the hunger dialogues, um, you may remember... Uh, you won't remember, but maybe Ellen would, rem would remember we did a, it was a youth summer garden club with the hunger, hunger dialogue in 2017, where we took um, elementary students um, who were from disadvantaged families and walked them through the growing season from April all the way through till September. Um, you know, so it's an opportunity to seeing where your gaps are, you know, seeing where your gaps are in the community, um, where you have um, whether it's, um, you know, areas of deficiency or excesses, seeing what resources you already have in your community that are perhaps being um, underutilized or treated as waste products, um, looking at, um, you know, I think 
you know, the, all of the civic groups, whether it's the Rotary, whether it's the, um, you know, the Kiwanis, whether it's, you know, the Lions Club, where are they focusing their time and energy in the community? Who's reaching out to them um, for assistance? Look at your local foundation, see uh, what type of, um, of organizations are being awarded um, uh, grants for projects, what type of projects are going on, um, you know, how active is Habitat in your community, how active, um, uh, you know, are, are these civic groups and just see how much, just try to assess the need. And I think trying to relieve some of that pressure with this type of work is fundamental. You know, I mean, yes, we would like to see everything electrified and yes, we would love to see, you know, uh, but it's like really solve the problems that are in your community right now versus like some, you know, projected goal. That that's mm -hmm. ideal for some other community. It's like, you know, I, I think we all would love to see, um, you know, a more stable climate. But really, I would love to see that, you know, fifty one percent of my um, of the children in our community weren't um, qualifying for free and reduced lunch. You know, like kind of remind me. Dan and I were just visiting um, a Mennonite community over the weekend. And we ended up going to one of the church services. And it just reminded me of the, the sermon. Like, mm. don't look at the speck in somebody else's eye until you the, take the plank out of your own. You know, like maybe we're looking globally and it really it has to start on a smaller scale. I'm not sure. Maybe that more resonates with me because I do get overwhelmed by the the large mm -hmm. scale picture. But I'm like, I, you know, mm -hmm. I, think I, can, I think I can do it in my home and maybe even, you know, this region. Yeah. Yeah, dealing with the waste stream, you know, organic waste going into our local landfill, you know, yes, you know, that we can, we can do a greenhouse gas inventory on and we can do uh, a waste characterization study on that and we can um, get the stats and it'll be really great to write a grant later, but honestly, if we all were just taking um, a little more of a inventory with what we throw away and what could be composted or is biodegradable, um, and then that could be oriented inside of our community for other enterprises as an income stream versus, um, you know, a, a toxic input in another location. And so, um, you know, just trying to think about that whole circular um reality that you know what comes into our community where is it coming from and how much of the how much of the the um residual of that is actually weighing our community down and then um what goes out of our community how much of that was actually a resource that we should have um utilized more of before it left that's I'll be quiet for a moment if somebody else would like to chime in, but then I'll, of course, have more questions if if you guys don't speak up. <laughs> there are quite a few people over there without their um, cameras on, so um, we, we do have a, a larger gathering than this. If you guys want to pop on and show yourselves or, or speak up, that would be wonderful. Do you have any questions? Okay, I have a question. So in your in your community faith, um, are there far? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, um, are there farms that uh, grow food and and give it give it to a food bank? Because I have a follow we, up. A follow up. If that's a, if that's a yes, that a yes. Yeah. We we do have farms that after the farmers market they will um, our local food pantry does allow for fresh produce drop off. And so um, we do have growers who bring produce to the Lord's cupboard. And then um, we've operated a couple um, giving gardens that just feed right in to our pantry. Okay, because uh, what we found in our community and one of our chapter members has a like a farm where they um, collect stuff in different places. But what we found is that the food, there's a lot of waste at the food bank. Like people drop off food. And um, so we've kind of changed our model. Um, and it's more like we're cooking meals in local churches and um, distributing like that. Because the, the food banks are great, but people just kind of drop it off. 
it sits around, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's just wasn't yeah. it's not, I mean, we still have that, but um, mm-hmm. there's more of an effort. Um, there are a couple different organizations around here that cook the food using church kitchens and um, I don't know, that yeah. seems to be working we, better here. We started a program very similar to that. We called it Come to Supper. And it's at our uh, local Lutheran church. And um, originally we started it, it stemmed out of the hunger dialogue um, group. And we would get together with four or five of us and um, commit to that week's supper. And the volunteers would go cook and then they would serve it um, in the, in the fellowship hall. And then as COVID came in, they switched the um, dine-in to takeout. And so they still do it that way. And so it's drive-by supper. So you can go up and just grab however many meals you would like. I'd love to see that it wasn't in styrofoam or plastic, but um, we'll have to work that out as, a, as an auxiliary issue. But it's, it's wonderful. We ask, we, I think we have another church that does something similar um, and then we also have, um, um, we have two programs, or I guess they're kind of the same thing. We have something called Little little Free P- Pantries, like a, a little library, a little free library, but these are little free pantries, and they are set up like the little free libraries, just a tiny little um, house on a pole, on a post in uh. front of someone's house, and then, um, and we have 12 of them in our community. And they're stocked with non-perishable food items. I'll throw seeds, packs of seeds in there too, whatever, you know, feels resonant for the moment. Um, Produce can go in there too, if it's optimal to do that. You know, someone, because it's attached with someone's home, they're responsible to kind of look after it and make sure nothing gets weird in there. Um, And so they're just like, there's no. What else besides seeds? What are other kinds of things? So can you give canned, me some examples? Canned goods, any type of canned mm-hmm. good, any type of non-perishable shelf-stable food item is stored in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're conscious of temperature. We're conscious, you know, they're, they're um, weatherproof little houses. Um, and, you know, you just open it up and grab whatever you need. <laughs> there's, um, you know, there's no, it's come as you may, you know, anybody can grab it. So you don't have to sign up anything. Nobody needs to know that you grabbed anything. Kids walking down the sidewalk can just grab the granola bar if they want to and have it. Um, And then we have uh, two um, uh, like food rescue fridges in the community as well that are um, used for perishable items. And we have a soup kitchen in our, um, in our community called Golden Magnolia. It started up Two years ago, I think they've been serving for a year and a half, all pretty much all donation. Um, a lot of the growers will also bring their excess aftermarket to the soup kitchen. And they um, it's a vegan soup kitchen. They prepare a meal Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. It's pay as you may. And so it's a great um, community gathering space for everyone you know it doesn't matter and it takes you know a lot of volunteer hours to to um facilitate the the prep and the serving of the food but it's just a community builder it's such an asset and then we have our indoor they this um golden magnolia purchased our old old presbyterian church beautiful old epic presbyterian church on our main street and they turned it into the soup kitchen and community event space. And we have our indoor farmer's market there um, from October to late April. And so not only um, is it uh, super community oriented around the food preparation, but also for keeping uh, local food economy alive. Yeah. Thank you, Ellen. I like all of that. And I, I, I totally get it. Our, our, um, our Lord's cupboard, um, the manager, uh, Susie, she is just so amazing, um, around the fresh produce and they, they save enough fridge space there to make sure everything goes in the fridge and then it goes right out, you know, when they open up their hours are somewhat limited, but it seems like a lot of it gets utilized, but you made me think about that. I need to actually go talk to them about their organic waste, where's it going and can we work with it you know 
What about um, like one issue we have uh, with one of the farms is growing and trying to get it into the urban communities is that we have different communities that want different kinds of food. Um, so how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. um, for our community, are you meaning like different uh, types of produce being grown? They would desire like cultural foods or? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we have a pretty diverse community for Southeast Iowa, um, but, you know, not far outside of the norm, but pretty diverse because of our university. And we do have, um, we do have a desire for more culturally specific foods. I think that our growers would absolutely be amenable to growing them. We have a, a <laughs> It's called the Regener Regenerative Organic Agriculture Program with our university. And um, there's an opportunity there as well to grow culturally specific foods. Um, but that's something that's under untapped. You know, we haven't really started to solve that issue yet. And so that will come up in our needs assessment with the community. But I know through observation that there is a, a desire to have, um, you know, food that that everyone wants you know yeah so culturally specific foods and we have i mean land is not a shortage here it's just getting access to it um and and uh and then you know some guidance and support to facilitate a program but i think yeah whether it's you know the farmers growing that produce or actually teaching and supporting the the students to do it themselves would be great yeah, and amazing. Thank you. I have a question. Or a couple of things are popping up here on the chat. So um, Matt from Shire Regenerative Farm is saying, awesome goals. Can you repeat the three biggest needs you've identified so far? Mm, yeah, I think the only three that I mentioned were for the food, the food waste group, oh, and buildings and energy. So, you know, I guess right now, deep focus is a very um, resilient food shed. And so that is increasing the number of small farms. We are in Iowa, 36 million acres, 27 million acres of that land area is oriented uh, towards big ag. Uh, you know, it's in the, in the business of agriculture, 23 to 24 million of those acres are planted in corn, corn and soybean. Uh, according to the census, uh, less than 1% of our um, acreage is utilized for um, human grade food, specialty crops. <laughs> so we need more uh, food growers in this epic state because we have some of the best topsoil on the planet. So um, uh, yeah, so increasing the integrity of our food shed is one focus. And so that is for our community as a whole, but you know, if, if something happened, if there were a disaster and the truck stopped coming, you know, we're all food insecure, but also we have high food insecurity in our community, um, be, you know, because we're a disadvantaged community. And then um, housing, housing stock integrity is something that I am really focused on. And then um, uh, optimizing infill in our community with housing. So utilizing, you know, whether that is, um, um, you know, kind of small, you know, whether that's micro homes, you know, uh, whether that is um, collective living, you know, built environments that are oriented towards um, communal living, but um, more than more than one household in a building um, would be great. And then also we have a, an aging population and our, um, our population is oriented towards the senior side in Fairfield. We have a lot, um, I think the average is maybe 17% of a community in Iowa is above the age of 65. And I think we're around 25% in Fairfield. So we have an aging population um, who would prefer in many cases um, to um, stay, you know, stay in a home, home, a home style environment, not a, not a, not an assisted living. And so figuring that out. And then also um, our organic waste 
you know, dealing with our um, organic waste going into our landfill is another issue that we're kind of focusing on at the moment. But forward thinking policy and planning and optimizing, optimizing the utilization of our underused spaces in our community right now, those are some of our primary orientations. Community connection, just community connection, having, um, having so many ways to access information and having um, such a broad demographic, you know, we're all different ages and we've, you know, your Gen Z's access information completely different than your um, boomer generation and the Gen X's in the middle can be split, but still we may not relate completely on either side and may not orient ourselves towards the same outlets. And so um, in the community, uh, print is dying. Your print newspapers are dying, especially in rural communities and um, also your local radio and local television because they're just not relevant anymore. And so when you don't have a centralized hub for communication resource and knowledge sharing, um, everything is, you know, it just kind of feeds the, the feeling of isolation. And so um, dealing with um, community connections through creating like solution hubs, uh, information hubs for um, information aggregation and then dissemination so that the resources that we do have are not underutilized and those that feel underserved have access to the resources that are available. They know how to get access. So that's a big issue. Are you prepared for an influx of people moving to your town after um, we share this recording? I'm like, oh, I would be like, <laughs> like, how fun and exciting. Um, yeah. One thing I was, I was curious get those about. those little micro houses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was curious about all the volunteers because you mentioned, you know, the people, but I think you addressed that a bit with the the population, the, the aging population. But we had mm -hmm. um, a few more things popping up here. So Rachel, hi, Rachel. I saw Rachel this weekend. Um she said, thanks for hosting this question. How did you identify the 30 folks? And then how did you further divide them into six subcommittees? I find mm -hmm. in our area, we have a lot of duplication and efforts, everyone working in their own silos. How did you unify and encourage collaboration? Mm -hmm. Well, I can't take credit for that because the Resilient Action Committee was already formed when I came on board. Um, but my understanding is it was personal reaching out, you know, hey, would you be interested in collaborating in this effort? Um, and because we are a community of, of, you know, pretty passionate community members who have, you know, a, a kind of orientation towards civic duty, we had a lot of people that signed up that said they would participate. And, um, and many of those have dropped off. It's, it's a three-year process and it's volunteer. And so um, the level of um, commitment is, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot to do. And so you have people that drop off, but they can recommend people. Our goal is to not keep bringing new people on once the process of uh, plan development has started, just because we don't want to dilute the effort and have to go back and um, kind of bring everybody up to speed every time. Um, but, you know, up until I joined the the initiative, it was um, still somewhat in development and they had already self-selected into their subcommittees. They have their, um, you know, these are all either experts in the field of, you know, energy, um, housing development, um, you know, architects. You know, when it comes down to, you know, the food waste group, it's food, you know, food hub uh, organizers or executive directors or um, or food chain coordinators or, um, you know, passionate uh, homesteaders, you know. And so it's people that have already kind of either been in the field or have um, a deep interest in the topic. They self-selected into their groups. And they're welcome to be on more than one group and they're welcome to switch if they want to. It's just wherever your passion leads you, stick that, you know, we want you to be in that group. <laughs> wherever your passion is, we want you in that group. Do you have any students or teens involved in any of the um, groups? Yeah, we 
don't have any teens. We have two Green Iowa AmeriCorps um, members who are students, but they are in their 30s. Um, and so they're not, hi, Dan. They're not, um, they're not teens. <laughs> We're getting an email <laughs> and text me on the scene. Sorry to interrupt. Keep going, yeah. <clears throat> the, um, the Sierra Club actually has um, two uh, high school seniors on their board, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Um, we are hiring for two more summer uh, Green Iowa AmeriCorps members, and we're orienting it towards um, recent high school graduates or um, early college um, students. And then we are participating with the um, University of Northern Iowa right now with a group of eight students who are in a climate action planning class there who are helping us for the next, you know, they they have a month and a half commitment with us, but we don't have any teenagers or um, young students on our resilient action committee. It's kind of hard with the time commitments. I find with, um, with students, especially during their school schedule, um, to be able to coordinate there as well. I think that might be an issue. Let me, um, there were a couple more things that popped up. We've got two here real quick and then um, you can answer that and then and then Dan can, can pipe in as well. There was a question here. Do you know sustainable housing expert, and I'm going to get this name all wrong, Joachim Klaas, C-L-A-E-S of Fairfield? That was just a, a question posed. I don't know this person. Are they Fairfield, Iowa? I, I guess so. so. You would you would think, Matt, it sounded like you were close by, so you'd probably mm -hmm. orient towards Fairfield, Iowa. Cool. Mm -hmm. No, I'll look them up. And I don't then, know them. One more question. Are you open to be contacted um, to help share some information? And which email or, or which one do you prefer for that? So if you want to contact me around the sustainability coordinator info, you can use uh, resilientff at gmail.com. Right. I will type that in over here. Thanks. Hi, Dan. How's it going? Great. We're having a blast here. The energy's high. I can feel it's like a party. There's music. Everybody's dancing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not wanting to interrupt. Let, let oh. Yeah, and all, we're all like, oh. <laughs> we're, I think we're all wrapped up. You all, all wrapped, wrapped up? up. I, showed, I showed up right on time. <laughs> right on time, as usual. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure that's not necessarily the case, but yeah, um, I think Sean and I were just talking about having me come and, you know, share for the chap leaders, uh, those who want to attend and then the recording for those who watch it, just the uh, exciting, um, you know, conference coming up. I'm not sure if anybody's seen the email or or seen the speakers or anything like that, but I'm, it's going to be great fun. Lots of, lots of buzz building. So, so um <clears throat> Yeah, I'm not sure if people have questions or want me to explain what the what the vision is and how it'll work. But um, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Why don't you I give guess. us the overview and then people yeah, can overview? Yeah. yeah. So so basically, you know, this is the first time we've had a, a sort of an event like this since 2021, um, which is the last time we did one, and the only time we did one online. And we've been doing a lot of work on research and. Um, you know, defining the true density since then. And as we said at one of these calls a few months ago, trying to, you know, re re um, focus on the <clears throat> grassroots and the education and the community building and the um that cross pollination um movement movement work that has been our core effort. So um I think this was part of the theme is similar to the theme we were trying to have in the 2022 conference, um, which we tried to have online, but none of the people showed up for it because we're to global of an organization, and that is the state of nutrient density. So where is it at with all the players, all the organizations, the companies, the researchers, the, you know, there's a whole amazing suite of um, people and organizations and networks that are starting to <clears throat> coalesce around nutrient density and, and take on pieces of the puzzle. And it's really, it feels much more of a, 
of an ecosystem now than a than a um a monoculture <laughs> say the bfa was the was like the individual plant or something you know like that was standing for it for a while now it feels like there's a much more of a, a really global web of, of 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 um activity so the vision is that we are you know hosting uh 16 uh weeks in a row from may i think it's at 14th to august 27th on tuesday afternoons um U.S. Eastern Time, uh, different time zones, different parts of the world. We've got a bunch of people from Australia who keep emailing. Are you going to record them? Do I have to be up at three a.m.? <laughs> well, if you register, uh, <laughs> you will get the recordings. Yeah, we, everything's being recorded and we'll set to registrants. You can watch them, watch them later. But um, yeah, it's uh, two hours, um, and the first hour is this is the presenter sharing their piece, and then the that you know the the first half of the second hour is the other presenters um asking that presenter questions because our objective is to have these people globally that are doing similar things who may not know each other give them a chance to actually meet and and engage um and then the last half hour is is the attendees um engaging as well so i think two hours is not going to be anywhere near long enough for any of these conversations it's they're just such potent full amazing like <laughs> downloads um really really excited so yeah <clears throat> it's uh you know it's 144 if you're a member if you're a chapter leader you should be a member so um yeah um everybody's welcome i thought not sure how many countries and continents and states you got registered already we only put it out like four or five days ago but it's it's uh yeah quite nice to see that that global that global spread is still still uh <laughs> really showing up so yeah it's kind is there of any way to find out who, like, I've, I've been trying to put it out there, the info. Is mm -hmm. there any way to find out who has signed up in our area or in our chapter or who has joined? I'm trying to encourage people to join as well. Yeah. I mean, I think formally, if you're a chapter leader, you should have access to the database of who's um, in your state or your region that's members. That's part of the thing when people join they they're they're very specifically asked as as members would you like to be part of be part of a local chapter so that's a database we have that you probably just haven't been made access given access to so how do i get access uh, to that i see shauna taking notes and i think she, that means she's probably like, going to either do I'm it herself taking a note her. now and that will be available somehow shauna's pretty good at following okay. up when you, uh, <laughs> okay when you thank say you for sure alan yeah, no, okay. no problem at all. And it actually would probably help because um, what I've been doing is looking at regions and how do I get people connected within these regions? Sometimes I've done like a group email or this sort of thing. But if I actually have chapter leaders reaching out, wanting to um, engage with people, do. that yeah. would be huge rather than like, hey, here's six people. I don't know where y'all live. But that's anyway, how, that's yeah. how it should happen. That would be the kind of the <laughs> principle of the chapter. <laughs> it's like you got, you're standing up saying, I want to be a leader. We're saying, here's the members in your area that want to be part of a chapter. That, that's, a, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> Sometimes these things are just like sitting in, sitting in uh, <laughs> plain sight. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> anyway. So that's, uh, that's, that's the basics. You'll be, it, we'll be sending out a newsletter a week. Um, if, um, between now and the conference starting with other updates and commentaries and things that we haven't gotten around to sharing, like the fact that we got a paper published in Nature um, that we didn't bother to tell anybody about. <laughs> so that's the <laughs> that's the headline. That's the headline in this 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 uh, this week's newsletter. Um, <clears throat> um, it's just it's Nature Science Communications. It's not just like the the big nature, but it's still like a very very legitimate journal. So. Um, so that's exciting, but um, do you have so anybody you want to? In, in each of those newsletters, we'll have we'll have you know detailed sort of um, here's a speaker, you know, two or three speakers, and who they are and what the topic is, and we'll be fleshing that out, sort of as having it be a momentum building um, thing. So, sorry, Shona. Oh, that's what I was going to ask. I'm like, did you want to tease tease the community with some of the people who might be sharing with us? I think they should need to read their newsletters. Oh, okay. <laughs> we have a remarkably high open rate on newsletters. It's like completely out of ordinary for, for nonprofits. It's like 55% or something. It's just a massive, a massive open rate. So um, 
Yeah. Um, we don't, we don't send out newsletters very often, but we try to keep them interesting. So that's, that, I think that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's how you get a high open rate is, is people, they only, when you send something over, they want to, they want, they're, they're curious about what it is. So, so yeah. <clears throat> right. Do we have any questions either for Dan or Faith or, or amongst yourselves before we wrap up today? We have a few minutes left. For sure, huh? Yeah, no question. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not taking questions today. <laughs> No, just kidding. If you have a question for me, certainly. No. I saw you re registered, Ellen, I think. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Did you register to Faith? Not, not yet. I didn't I didn't think I saw your, your name come through yet. Yeah. <clears throat> it's fun to see them all popping in. You know, Great Britain, Portugal, Australia, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's like... <laughs> New York, Rhode Island, California. Yeah. So. Well, and I'm trying to like the conversation we were having is very much uh, a small community and the what exact opposite done. of that. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, we were talking about, oh, our soil and nutrition conference, which has always been in person, which is now global. How do we also bring people together at that scale and have that communication going? So I love this aspect of the conference that's going to include the speakers talking. You know, because yeah. like you said, sometimes you have people doing this over here and this over here. Might as well. And we were just down in Tennessee and, you know, happened to meet Rachel and we're talking about putting together an in-person event in the fall, which I'm not even sure we should tell anybody about because it's not clear yet. But um, yeah, <laughs> hanging out with a bunch of uh, Amish and, and uh, Mennonites. So so uh, <laughs> as it pertains to actually real, real lived community culture on the lands homesteading humble honorable like like definitely have a lot to learn um not that it's perfect but but um yeah boy we sure have a lot to learn <laughs> the rest of us <laughs> uh, remember hey, remember yeah donna I, maybe if rachel has time rachel the Oh, graphic our, designer. Our Rachel. Yeah. You're yeah. Rachel. Um, it would be handy to have, I just thought it would be nice to have just a simple shareable um, post that just says, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to attend the yeah. bionutrient food. So, you know, it says, and then it's just an automatic share, you know, that you don't yeah. have to actually put a description or anything in there. It's just like, I'm going, are you, you know, yeah. something of that nature. We've got a few uh, share. social media posts that we're going to be reviewing in about an hour and a half that are going to be going out. And that would be one of them we could put out 100%. Yep. <clears throat> well, I love this time together. I just, um, for me, it's always inspiring, but I also feel like sometimes, you know, we're kind of quiet for like the rest of the month. And to me, I just feel like there's so much going on. If, you know, like, I, I, I'm not sure. Like we're trying to do the newsletters and we're trying to post here and there, but um, please reach out if you ever just want to check in and 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 get a feel. It's not that we're not trying. Like we hear people saying, we want to get together in person. We're like, all right, we're working on it. But um, love to hear, hear from people. Everybody's doing such amazing things. Like I said, I always leave these so inspired. I've got a whole list here. I'm like, what could I do in my community? Um, <laughs> So just to reassure you, we are working really hard to try to figure something, you know, figure this out. But, well, uh, coordinating regional events and, you know, local, it's not, it's not, you can't do one, one, one thing for the whole planet. You got to be connecting with people in their bioregions and their mm -hmm. communities. And that's, I think that's obviously the trajectory. Certainly keep the global community alive online, but be really facilitating the local yeah. engagement. Um, yeah. That can be a theme for next month if you want, Shana. Another theme. I'm happy to another thing, another theme. thing. <laughs> right. well no i mean there's a lot going on you know with these yeah. local regional events not just here and us but other partners around the world and and you know this it's really really happening so <clears throat> mm -hmm. and also i would just encourage you we have one minute left if you have somebody in your community that you think would want to share online that is doing it can be it can be broad like what faith is doing like her has her hands in all of these pots or it can be something very specific like eric hubbard last last month who is working specifically with seeds like anything somebody who would would like to share that or you think would be valuable um 
it's just I'm really trying to start those conversations in our communities. And I feel like that's that's happening. Um, but you guys are all doing amazing things. And I'd love to hear hear from more people. Faith, thank you. This was so Sorry, good to be um, young. Yeah, <laughs> caught up. I'll, and... think, I'll think of the personal update. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's so great. It's so great to see your faces and to uh, hear your voices. And let's, yeah, let's keep doing this all the time. Cool. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Bye. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks.